Would you consider adopting a new mindset? Would you consider adopting a new mindset if I were able to show you that it resulted in the most pro-social, pro-economic forces on the planet? Forces that, while they're rationally in your self-interest, are also for the greater good of our society? Before you answer that question, let me tell you a story about my friend Ted. This isn't actually Ted. Ted's better looking than this. But I think of Ted as an old hippie. He was born in, the, uh, in a Midwestern town, Muncie, Indiana, where he was an only child, where his mom was a stay-at-home mom, and his dad was an assistant professor in one of the state universities. And they loved Ted. Ted was a really a bright kid. He was a reader, not a good athlete, uh, but he uh, was introspective, and he realized at a very early age that his parents thought the world was a world of scarcity, a world that was dangerous and, and that he should be protected from. And he realized at an early age, he told me maybe six or seven, that he, his expectations for himself were greater than his parents were actually for him. They thought they were keeping him safe by keeping his expectations low. When Ted graduated from high school, he and a couple friends bought a VW microbus and they drove it all the way down through Mexico and Central America and right down to the tip of South America, what's called the Pan American Highway. <clears throat> and Ted was thrilled. He had a ball. And he found that he actually had a, uh, a, a unique ability for uh, being um, able to listen to people, whether it was around the steering wheel or around the campfire. He found that uh, he could empathize with them, he could take their perspective, and they listened to him. And he thought to himself, maybe the world isn't such a scary, dangerous place after all. Maybe it's a world filled with learning and growth. After four years, uh, four sort of indifferent years at an Eastern Ivy League college, Ted, like many uh, college students, wasn't totally sure what he was going to do upon graduation, and he signed up for a two-year hitch in the Peace Corps, where he had his mind open and his heart illuminated by the people of Ghana. And in Ghana, Ted was given a shovel, and he put his foot on the shovel, and he worked on environmental projects and agricultural projects, but he was particularly drawn to uh, water projects. He felt that access to clean water was synonymous with increasing quality of life. And um, Ted found that he was what Adam Grant would call a giver. Not a matcher, not a taker, but a giver. And he found that he was trusting. And because he was trusting, he became trusted. Ted uh, found that as he worked with villages in this arid part of Ghana where they relied on rivers for their drinking water, that the villages typically would uh, you know, use the, the river for drinking, but they might also use the river for washing and cleaning, and they might also use the river for carrying away their waste, which wasn't so great if you were downstream. And Ted found that he could um, develop a dialogue between different villages and get them, uh, villages could be of different cultural backgrounds, to uh, begin to come together and talk about how they were going to use the water resources together. And in fact, he developed what he called later kind of a replicable methodology that he was able to show other Peace Corps volunteers step by step how they could go in and, and develop these uh, villages' water systems as well. When Ted left the Peace Corps after a couple of years, he was really uh, of mixed mind. In fact, he thought about uh, joining the Peace Corps as a full-time professional. But he concluded that that was really for the politically shrewd more than the personally passionate. And he came back to North America and he uh, took a PhD in anthropology from the American University in Washington, where he learned sort of the, the scientific and the theoretical foundation for a lot of what he had been working on for the last couple of years. He also met a lot of interesting people, including his future wife, Nancy, and they got married. And when they both left American University, they moved to California where Ted joined the faculty of a university system in California and began to teach uh, in the anthropology area. And he tried to fit in with the life of a faculty person, but he wasn't in the flow. He wasn't getting the same juice from feeling like he was making a super positive difference in people's lives like the way he did in uh, Ghana. And uh, on a whim one day, he sat in on an auditorium not unlike this, and a couple of officials from the World Bank were there talking about their consulting projects in developing countries. And Ted was sitting in the back of the room, and they talked about the fact that they wanted to do consulting in the areas of environment and agriculture and water. And Ted raised his hand, and he said, hey, how do you get to be one of those consulting firms that does that? And they said, well, uh, we put out a request for quotation, 
and uh, people get back to us generally with the scope of work, uh, who they're going to put on their team, what the credentials are, and uh, you know what the budget is. Ted rode his bicycle home that night. He was bubbling over when he came back to Nancy and said, I can't believe this. I mean, it sounds like I could work on a purpose that I feel passionately about. I could choose the people I work with, and I could make a living doing this. But, oh my God, I mean, I've never even taken a business course in my life. I don't know anything about bookkeeping. I don't even know how to put a budget together for this. And she said, Ted, I can do that. He said, you can? Go with me to look at another set of books. This is a global set of books. This slide would be a slide of economic output per person for the years 1,000 to 2,000. What do you see when you look at this slide? Because what I see is a flat line. No economic output increase per person in over 1,000 years. What this tells me is that people in 1650 would recognize really well what the people in 950 were doing. They were doing two things, trying to stay warm, trying not to be hungry. Now look what happens in the late 19th, early 20th century. That line goes up, doesn't it? And it doesn't go up like linearly. It goes up logarithmically, and it keeps on going. What happened there? And who is this handsome fellow? <laughs> this would be Josiah Wedgwood, who was born in uh, 1730, exactly 100 years before Charles Darwin's foot hit the deck of the HMS Beagle. He was born in the Midlands in the UK. He was the youngest of 13 children, of which eight survived. He was drawn to his father's craft, which was as a potter. His father worked in the home as a potter. His mom was a stay-at-home mom. But a tragedy overcame the area when a smallpox broke out. And Josiah fortunately lived, but he lost the use of his right leg, which later had to be amputated. No anesthetic, by the way. And he was so drawn to his, his father's pottery and so interested in that, parents, of course, said they wanted to protect him and they wanted to make sure he was going to be okay as an adult and he was injured. They wanted him to become maybe a teacher or maybe a minister. But Josiah always asked his father about the pottery. And he began to ask his father a series of questions. Why does the pottery always have to be the same sort of brown color? Why do we bring the pottery to market and always sell it in pieces? Could we ever consider selling it in sets? And father, what if you designed the pottery? And what if you threw the pot? And what if you glazed the pottery? And what if you fired the pottery? Because we each can make one pot per day, but together we can make 20 pots per day. And of course, Josiah and his peers stumbled upon the magic of the division of labor, which fueled economic output for the next 200 years and it's not done. He poured himself into his, into his craft and into his business for the next several decades, where he, uh, of course, made what is now called the Wedgwood Pottery Works, and which became a sustaining organization that lasted well beyond him. In fact, it's still with us today. Interestingly, too, he built a fortune along the way. And in the second chapter, or third chapters of his life, he became an ardent abolitionist. Did you know this about Josiah Wedgwood? 100 years before the Emancipation Proclamation, he was a world-known abolitionist. In fact, uh, the Wedgwood Pottery Company cast a cameo, an oval cameo, that showed a kneeling African man with the words underneath, am I not a man and your brother? which then became a very fashionable item for people who were also abolitionists in England and across Europe. So Josiah Wedgwood built this business, this long sustaining business, a positive legacy, a fortune, and he also had this legacy as an abolitionist. And oh, by the way, one more thing. He was the actual grandfather of Charles Darwin. And you might think the way he unlocked the entrepreneurial spirit he was the spiritual grandfather of Ted. Maybe he's the spiritual ancestor of some of you here. You remember that Ted and Nancy were founding Water Development Associates, and um, they poured themselves into the business for the next two decades with their family growing and the business growing at the same time. Ted was having a ball. He loved making a permanent positive difference in the clients that he worked with. And he actually liked the business side of it too. He built the business, it grew and grew. I used to kid him that um, some people have a management strategy of management by walking around. Ted's strategy was manage by party. If there was gonna be a problem, people were feeling fatigued, he'd have a beer bash on Friday afternoon. He had a couple of black tie dinners 
to keep the troops motivated. The business grew and grew. It grew to be hundreds of employees and 20 offices around the world. But my experience with entrepreneurs as they become successful and grow their organizations, it's not a smooth arc. It's a series of jagged steps, challenges. And Ted faced those challenges. One of the challenges was to uh, fund the growth of the company. And he and Nancy would go to the bank and borrow millions of dollars to fund the growth of the company that they personally guaranteed to the banks. Ted struggled with uh, keeping the uh, strategy on course. He had a lot of great people who were very successful in the consulting practice and wanted to move it to water, agriculture, democracy, anti-terrorism. And Ted kind of <clears throat> had to pull them back and focus on what their distinctive competence was. That was a full-time job in itself. He also ch was challenged by the people issues. So he had some people he tried to promote from within, but not everyone who was a great environmental consultant turned out to be a great middle manager. He hired some professional managers, but he was concerned that they didn't hear the authentic heartbeat of the company. Ted woke up five in the morning, as many entrepreneurs do, heartbeat speed up and race, a little sweat break out on his brow, and thought to himself, I'm so grateful for what we've been able to build here with Water Development Associates. But I never realized I was going to work myself into a position of such responsibility. I mean, I have all these stakeholders now who are counting on me to continue to have this organization be successful. I mean, I really love what I do, but I didn't mean to sign up for a life sentence, did I? There's a little thought experiment for you. What do you think these names are when they're presented to you in this order? They're entrepreneur owner managers, for sure, and great ones. But in this order presented to you, these are the names of the 12 largest charitable foundations in North America. So these people who built sustaining organizations and built a fortune along the way uh, have given away a substantial part of their fortune to fund what I was going to call the not-for-profit sector, but now I'm going to call the all-profit sector. <laughs> Where did the wealth that they gave away come from? Did they work for salary and save it up? Nope, they didn't work for salary and save it up. Did they inherit it? Nope, they didn't inherit it. This is a great example of how long-term sustainable wealth is created in North America. In one way, through entrepreneurs focusing on sustainable competitive advantage and investing in this illiquid, risky, concentrated investment that grows and grows often beyond what they ever dreamed and then realize someday in the form of a capital gain. What happens to the capital gain? They spend some of it, sure, but the rest of it goes to fund virtually all of the all-profit sector in our country. I remember a wintry day coming back to Ted and Nancy, being in their lawyer's office, and Ted and Nancy were sitting across the table from me, so was their lawyer, and Ted uh, was beautifully dressed. He had long hair, piercing gray eyes, and he looked at me and he said, Pete, Nancy and I have made a decision. We're moving on to the next chapter. And I said, okay. And he said, we've decided that we really have a lot of things we want to do next. And he sort of had, as if he had a notebook in front of him, he turned it like this and said, we want to do some things in philanthropy. In fact, we've given $30 million of Water Development Associates stock to our private charitable fund. We are thinking about starting a new business with a couple of our kids. I might have a book in me, he said. We're going to do some traveling. And so it's really important to me that we find the next owner for the business and that we do a great job at it. So for the next six months, we architected a strategy that allowed Ted and his management team to go and choose the next majority owner for the business, who ended up being a very mission-driven, publicly-owned business on the West Coast that had businesses that were sort of in adjacencies to Ted's, not overlapping. And uh, the management team uh, worked with Ted to choose which investor that would be. In fact, I had the fun of being with the president of the company two weeks ago, and he was uh, just having uh, all kinds of uh, excitement with me in his office because he said, you'll never believe this. We have the exact same management team today, except for Ted, that we had when we did the transaction, and now we are four times the size that we used to be. Our natural human condition is to tirelessly strive and strive, isn't it? And maybe we never reach that place called complete fulfillment. But the striving behavior was biologically selected in us over tens of thousands of years. It's literally imprinted in our DNA. It's what we, especially owner-managers, but all of us, were built to do. 
So I wonder if, if we know that striving for a goal is actually more important to our subjective well-being than achieving the goal. I wonder if, armed with that knowledge, we actually are in a completely fulfilled place. A few minutes ago, I asked you, would you be willing to consider changing your mindset? Josiah Wedgwood had a big idea, and he had passion, but he had troubles. He had fears. He had adversity, which he overcame, and he built a fortune and a long-lasting business that benefited all the stakeholders around him. And he had another chapter. Ted had a big idea, and he had passion, and he overcame his fears and his concerns, and he built a long-lasting organization, and he's done great work in the subsequent chapters of his life. The genius of the mindset entrepreneur is that by doing something that's rationally in your self-interest, the result unlocks the most positive, pro-social, and pro-economic forces in the world. Maybe some of you in this room have a big idea. Maybe some of you in this room have passion. And I'm challenging you, will you overcome your fears and adopt a mindset entrepreneur? We need you, all of us need you to succeed. Oh, by the way, I knew I was gonna be with you today, and so I talked to Ted about a week ago. And I said to him, hey buddy, how's it going in your next chapter? And he said, oh, pretty good, Pete, but you're going to laugh like hell at me. I said, why? He said, because, I don't know, I just miss having my foot on the shovel. And Nancy and I are thinking about signing up for another two-year hitch in the Peace Corps. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>